I would like to welcome everybody to today's Art and Conversation. My name is Jaleesa Johnston and I am Programs Lead in the Learning and Community Partnerships Department at the Portland Art Museum. And for my audio description, um, or sorry, for my uh, verbal description, um, I would like to share that I am a black woman. I have curly black hair uh, about shoulder length. I'm wearing silver hoop earrings. Um, I have black rim glasses. Um, I have a lip and two nose piercings. I'm wearing a red plaid shirt. I'm sitting in a blue room um, and behind me are two bookcases full of books. I'm very happy to be sharing our final art and conversation of the year with you all. Um, just to give you some information about Art and Conversation, if you're a newcomer and you've never been to the program before, um, Art and Conversation is a program, a regular program at the museum. It happens monthly. It happens um, every third Tuesday of the month. Um, and it's been running for uh, quite a long time. And pre-COVID, before quarantining, um, usually what would happen is on that third Tuesday of the month, um, audience members, community members would gather at the museum um, around 9.15 for a social hour of coffee and donuts. And then there would be um, a talk at 15. And our talks have featured um, a range of speakers from curators speaking on exhibitions um, that are on at the museum to community partners, um, arts organizations in the Portland community, artists um, that we also work with and it's a really lovely time to hear about different art projects um, that are happening. And then uh, after the program, uh, the program itself is free. And afterwards, everybody who attended the program gets to go into the museum um, for free and see all the lovely work that's on view there. Um, right now, due to uh, COVID, we are doing this virtually. So we have a roughly one hour discussion. Um, and the upside to this is that we're able to make this program more accessible to a larger audience, maybe people that have never been able to come to the museum. Uh, so that's a really exciting, um, an exciting aspect for us about this moment. Um, and with that, I'm very excited that we're closing this year's Art and Conversation series um, with a talk on the exhibition. Uh, it's a current exhibition that's on view. Jordiu Hanga Kyokai, 1956 to 1965, Japan's women's, women printmakers. And uh, Jini Kimotsu will be giving this talk. Uh, Jini Kimotsu is Japan Foundation Associate Curator of Japanese Art and Interim Head of Asian Art at the Portland Art Museum. She is also a senior fellow with the Andrew W. Mellon Society of Fellows in Critical Bibliography at Rare Book School. She has organized a number of exhibitions and installations of Asian art since coming to the museum in 2017, but her research interests focus on painting and print in early modern Japan, as well as contemporary Asian art, illustrated books, and the international post-war reception of modern Japanese prints, which she'll be speaking about today. And we're very excited. Thank you, Jeannie, for joining us this morning and for um, helping us close this year's series of programs. Thank you for that introduction, Jalisa. I'm so glad to be speaking for Art and Conversation today. And I'm thankful for all of you who have tuned in for this program. Um, and thankful also to the museum staff like Jalisa, who's working behind the scenes. So shout out to Becky Emmert and John Richardson. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, first, I'll start with my verbal description. Um, I am a woman of color with brown hair. I am wearing brown rimmed glasses, gold earrings, a um, cream turtleneck, and I'm in a white room with a ceiling fan you might see above me and two bookshelves against the wall behind me. Um, also with respect to captions, um, we know from experience that captioning technology does not work. Um, it does not play very nicely with other languages, especially non-Western ones. So the names for the artists that I will say will probably be garbled in the captions if you are using them. 
Um, so please just refer to how the names are written on the slide and we will also put the names of the main artists that I talk about in the, uh, I think in the chat box. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Oh, and I lost my Zoom screen. There we go. Yes. Oh, I think my uh, share screen permissions uh, need to be adjusted, Jalisa. Yeah. My apologies, I just added that in. Okay, here we go. Here we go. So today I'll be speaking about an extraordinary group of artists who came together in 1956 to collaborate in organizing group exhibitions of their work. The 1950s and 60s in Japan saw printmaking really thrive as an art form. For several decades prior, the artists of the Sosaku Hanga or the creative print movement, they had championed the creativity and the labor, the genius of the individual artist. This was in contrast to traditional Japanese printmaking models. And then in the post-war period, artists emerging from the creative print movement found an enthusiastic foreign audience for their work. Uh, first with American occupation forces and then later abroad in biennials and museum shows. But very few women were featured in these key exhibitions and publications or in the art societies that provided the critical infrastructure for professional artists. Within this context emerged Japan's first printmaking society for women artists, the Joryu Hanga Kyokai, or the Women's Print Association. This society of artists is the subject of my latest exhibition at the Portland Art Museum. It is called Joryu Hanga Kyokai 1956 to 1965, Japan's Women Printmakers. Now this is the first new exhibition to open at the Portland Art Museum since our closure due to uh, the coronavirus pandemic in March. So I hope some of you have been able to see it in person. Um, it is also the first exhibition anywhere to focus on this pioneering group of women artists. Um, as I think you can begin to see already from the very different images on your screens, the artists themselves were not united by a shared creative ideology or a single artistic process. They said so they did not work in a unified mode or aesthetic nor indeed were they working in a single printmaking medium. Their annual exhibitions in Tokyo were the core of their activity together, but they also organized exhibitions of their work in such far flung places as Osaka, Washington DC, Honolulu, uh, and New York City. I first became interested in this group while working on a separate project on the artist Yoshida Chizuko, whose work you see here in the lower center, and we'll return to these images later. I knew she had been a member of a group called the Joryu Hanga Kyokai, but the group itself was a little bit of a mystery. Now, if you read all of the standard texts on modern Japanese prints in both English and Japanese languages, you will see references to this group, but these references are, I mean, they're basically useless. They answer none of the basic questions. Things like, what was this group? Who were the members? How long was it active? And although this collective was certainly known at the time, it has been largely relegated to a footnote in the history of 20th century printmaking in Japan. The Portland Art Museum is home to an exceptionally strong collection of modern prints. The core of that collection was built by the late Gordon Gilkey, who was the museum's first curator of the graphic arts. And you see him here in a black and white photograph in the print vault. In 1983, Donald Jenkins, the museum's first curator of Asian art organized the important exhibition, Images of a Changing World, Japanese prints of the 20th century. And Donald's uh, show included loans, but it also drew very heavily on that permanent collection. And more recently, recently retired curator Mary, ba Mary Beth Graybill 
organized the first survey of the museum's critically significant Japanese print collection as a whole. I'm sure some of you saw this show in 2011. Um, it surveyed the collection from the 17th century to the present. And she also organized a focused and insightful show looking at five Japanese women printmakers, including two former members of the Joryu Hanka Kyokai. So as a result of these really groundbreaking efforts by my predecessors, Portland has built a sustained record of engagement with Japan's modern printmaking history. And in fact, despite the exhibitions that you see here, none of the works in my current exhibition, with the exception of two, have ever been shown before. I've also been very lucky to work with private collections in New York, Tokyo, and Portland. Now, as I started to piece together the exhibiting history of this society, the picture that began to emerge for me suggested that even with a rich collection to draw from, the Women's Print Association, or Joryu Hanga Kyokai, has been to some extent hiding in plain sight. And I want to make the point that it was English language publications that were really defining the genre in the 1950s and 60s. And they played a significant role in the reception of these artists and their work. The pioneering book was, of course, Oliver Statler's The Modern Japanese Print and Art Reborn. This book created essentially almost a canon of the modern Japanese print, at least for an American audience. It was first published in June 1956, and then a second printing was already out a few months later. This is the 13th printing that you see on the screen. This is what I have a copy of. It's from 1976. And there were still further printings after. Now you can find the copies of this book uh, easily today. It was without question a huge hit. It shaped the knowledge and the tastes of an English speaking audience. And then along with Statler, uh, there was also James Michener, the novelist, who was another key figure in all of this. Michener was also a collector himself and he had provided early encouragement to Statler. Uh, he even wrote the introduction to Statler's book. So the book that you see now on the right is a deluxe edition. This was Michener's own sort of brainchild. Um, it was the result of a two-part juried competition that was held between Tokyo and New York City in 1959. And what you see here um, with the stripes, uh, vertical stripes um, in the center is the deluxe edition. It came in a wooden slip case. It's this very, very large oversized uh, sort of elephant limited edition. And inside are 10 original prints by the selected artists, along with uh, commentaries by Michener. Then a popular edition of this appeared in 1968. And again, that book is in libraries everywhere today. You can find it very easily. So these kinds of books had an immediate effect on private collecting and institutional display in the United States. Um, this matters in part because I think one of the very first surveys of Japanese printmaking from a Japanese perspective doesn't appear in English until 1967, which is nearly a decade later. For the first uh, Joryu Hango Kyokai exhibition in 1956, this red invitation card was printed. <clears throat> By this time, several of the founding members such as uh, Shishiro Tokuko, Yoshida Chizuko, Iwami Reika, also uh, Kobayashi Donge. They were among the few women who were already admitted to prestigious associations. And they were beginning to show their work regularly in the premier group exhibitions in Japan, such as uh, the annual exhibitions of the Japan Print Association, uh, which is Nihon Hanga Kyokai, still active today. Art societies like these have been so important for the professional artist in Japan throughout the 20th century. They offered a peer network, but they were also a critical vehicle for exhibition and for publicity. It was, it was a way to be noticed by dealers, collectors, curators, the public. So despite these gains in the art world of the time, the women that you see pictured here have never attained the level of fame of their celebrated male peers, sometimes their own husbands. While sort of galleries, the press, oh, 
forgive me, galleries and the press and collectors were all reliably supporting the careers of male artists, the Joryu Hanga Kyokai Society provided infrastructure and professional support. So in other words, it was this crucial vehicle for talented female printmakers to present their own artwork in consistent annual exhibitions for a decade. Here you see some of the ephemera from the exhibitions they organized. Um, they had guest books, which you see two of in the lower left, uh, invitation cards, which you see in the uh, upper left. These announced upcoming shows were often designed by the artists themselves or by uh, fellow artists, male artists, um, and even lists of works, which you see on the right. This is a typical practice at art exhibitions in Japan, even today. Uh, you can go to a um, almost any museum exhibition and you can get a printout of the works being displayed, even if it's over a hundred works, it's just very, very common. Here you see the nine founding members of Joryu Hanga Kyokai. And I believe this photograph is from the opening for the first exhibition on October 22nd, 1956 at the Yoseiro Gallery. From left to right, you see, uh, and I will name each of them, you see Nishigai Kazuko, Yoshida Chizuko, Hayashi Tomiko, in the very center, looking directly at the camera, is Uchima Toshiko, Kobayashi Donge, Iwami Reka is there with her face partly obscured, Nonaka Yuri, and Shishiro Tokuko. Not pictured here is Minami Keiko, who was already living in Paris by this time. Over the next decade, the group would grow to encompass at least 25 different artists. These printmakers worked in the full range of methods, many in the uh, techniques of color woodblock printing that were the foundation of the Sosaku Hanga movement, but others specialized in intaglio techniques or lithography, and quite many of them also experimented. They used new materials, there were a lot of monotypes that they were making. So the rest of my talk will focus on the five artists who are the primary subject of the current exhibition with a little bit of the remaining time on some additional artists who joined the group over the next 10 years. Iwami Reika is probably the best known of the Joryu Hanga Kyokai artists today. Her work is found widely in North American museums to say nothing of private collectors. And her work is very recognizable you see her here in the lower right as a young woman in what I believe is the very first Joryu Hanga Kyokai exhibition in 1956. At left is a kind of signature piece from her early years. This print shows the restricted palette that she was known for. It's usually monochrome with uh, dark reds and touches of mica. Um, it's also a, uh, very typical in terms of being sort of an abstracted landscape. And it shows one of the themes that she would return repeatedly to over her long career, which is the sea. Iwami's story is also better known than some. She was actually training as a doll maker. Uh, she was apprenticed to a prestigious master of traditional Japanese doll carving when she discovered woodblock printmaking. <clears throat> Some of this background is recounted by Michener in his book, The Modern Japanese Print. Um, as you recall from earlier, this was Michener's big sort of pet project, and it was an attempt to support and encourage contemporary printmakers. Iwami was one of two women selected for this deluxe book of original prints, and you can see her submission here on the right. The other was the other artist was Shima Tamami, who we will see a little bit later. I brought this book into the show because I think publication really helped make Iwami's career. She was already exhibiting with the Women's Print Association with Joryu Hanga Kyokai, uh, also with the Japan Print Association and others. But this book, especially the popular edition from 1968, it really helped elevate her reputation with English speaking audiences and particularly collectors. 
again, this is um, in the case of both prints, this is the earlier style she's known for with these deep red tones and uh, textured grays in these kind of semi -ab abstracted landscapes. Her later style is also really recognizable, uh, particularly these textured monochrome compositions that bring out as much character of the wood grain as possible. Uh, and like here, she uses gold, or um, sometimes silver foil that creates these bright, really luminous highlights. I think you can see why Iwami is such a popular printmaker. I was very sad to hear of her passing in March of this year at the age of 93. But it's unquestionable that she had an incredibly long and productive career. I think it's worth pointing out that unlike many of the group's founders, Iwami never married or had children and she had the early support of one of the biggest ambassadors for Japanese prints, James Michener. This print that you see on the screen was made in 1964 when she was still exhibiting with Joru Hanga Kyokai. But already in 1964, she has hit on the sort of overall aesthetic that she would pursue for decades to come. So I think that speaks to a real clarity in her artistic practice, something that she's pretty remarkably achieved basically in the first decade of making prints. <laughs> One of the most surprising and wonderful events for me personally while working on this show has been the discovery of an Iwami print that was a little bit unlike anything I'd seen before in person. And you see that print here on the left. Um, the print is undated, but I believe it is one of her earliest prints. I've dated it to the 1950s based on um, a few factors. So the materials, uh, also the style of these curving abstracted serif-like shapes, uh, the palette of rich deep red, warm dark yellow, it's almost sort of like a warm golden rod, uh, and based on comparison also with a few of her other early prints which are very rare. So then putting this print in relationship with both her work of the late 50s and early 60s, which you see in the top row, and then the later phase from about the mid 60s onward, uh, these are all prints in the exhibitions. Um, I feel as though I've really been able to understand the whole of her practice and her career that much better. I, I really see the relationships um, in a whole new way. So that as an art historian has been really exciting and um, as a curator to be able to represent that sort of range of her career in just a few prints has been really wonderful. I tend to think of Yoshida Chizuko as one of the ringleaders of the Women's Print Association. Yoshida was one of the most well-connected and in some ways most established of the Joryu Hanga Kyokai artists. She married into the well-known Yoshida family of artists, which was at the time headed by Yoshida Hiroshi, who was a, a painter and then became this fantastic printmaker in the early 20th century. He's still today the most famous of the artists in the Yoshida family. But Hiroshi's sons, Toshi and Hodaka, had followed in his footsteps and his wife, Fujio, was also a painter and printmaker. So prints were truly the family business. Um, Chizuko, who married into the family, had been a painter. <clears throat> and she did not begin making prints until after her marriage to Hodaka. But once she started making prints, she really never looked back. The print on the right is named after Jama Masjid in Delhi, one of the largest mosques in India, which she would have seen while um, on her honeymoon. She and Hodaka embarked on a kind of working honeymoon in 1957, traveling all around the world for a year. <clears throat> now this print is very typical of her work during the years that Joryu Hanga Kyokai was exhibiting together. It has a really strong graphic sense and bold colors, uh, which you can also see a bit in the prints that she's handling here in her studio in the photograph on the left. This photograph provides a really interesting image. 
it comes from a piece that was basically a photo essay of Joryu Hanga Kyokai members. Um, and I have to believe that they were happy with the press coverage, but it's still very much a product of its time. So the, it's several pages of these full bleed, big uh, black and white photographs of the artists working in their studios or hanging prints. Um, but if you read the captions, and there's not a lot of text, but if you read the captions, at one point, the writer calls them mama-san hangaka, so mommy printmakers. And that description is so at odds with the kind of self-presentation I see here with Yoshida Chizuko and the way that she's posed herself looking at prints um, in her studio as she's pulling them from the block. I, I think it's remember important to remember though that this kind of language and framing was yet another challenge that they faced as artists. These are two early prints by Yoshida Chizuko. They're fairly typical of many of her earliest prints. They're small in size, full of energy and movement. And although the colors are perhaps a little bit less bold here than what we saw just a moment ago, there's still this sense of exuberance, even in the use of color. Her, uh, her early background was in dance and music. And this print uh, on the left titled Rainy Day is partly a visualization of the sound of rain falling. Many of her prints from this period were about music. In the photograph at upper left, you can see one of her other early prints, which is called Mambo in the background of the photograph. Um, that print is from 1956 and it was also inspired by music. What I like about these prints is how they show she's clearly um, working toward that same kind of abstraction that we just saw two years earlier, but she hasn't quite yet pared down her compositions as she would soon begin to do, as we saw with uh, Jama Masjid. Like Iwami Reika, Yoshida would go on to make prints for decades. She had a very long career. These prints were produced just after Joryu Hanga Kyokai's life as, a, as an organization, but they indicate some of the range and the changes in Yoshida's practice. And I also quite frankly included them because they're so striking and they seem to really have that forceful impact and sense of surprise. I mean, they've literally stopped people in their tracks in the gallery. Um, they're photographed here in raking light so you can really see the deep patterns created by blind embossing in the paper. Certainly there's a, a bit of op art and minimalist influence that she's exploring here, but um, there's still a sense of a referent. The work on the right uh, is a landscape. It's called Landscape in Blue. <clears throat> Yoshida would soon shift away from this type of truly pared down type of composition uh, but it does anticipate some of the work she would go on to do in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, and they've been really very popular. Uh, just a reminder for those who have just tuned in, we know that the names for the artists I am referring to will probably be quite garbled in the captions you see on your screen. So for the main six or seven artists I am discussing today, please just refer to how the names are written on the slide. Uh, and we have also put the names of the artists in the chat box. Uchima Toshiko, um, another of the collective's founding members, is one of the least well known today. <clears throat> in the early 1950s, she began exhibiting her paintings with avant-garde groups like the Democrato Artists Association. And in 1954, she married Uchima Ansei, a fellow printmaker. Like Yoshira Chizuko and her husband, this couple maintained a lot of connections in the world of contemporary printmakers. And I think she too might have had a kind of leadership role in the Joryu Hanga Kyokai. She was a little bit older and her husband Ansei had worked closely with Oliver Statler when he was interviewing artists for his book on Sozaku Hanga or Creative Prints. Um, although she remained a member of the Women's Print Association for the group's entire run, uh, in 1959, 
she and her husband and young son moved together to the United States where Anse had been born. They settled in New York City and she supported her husband's successful career as a practicing artist and teacher at Sarah Lawrence College and Columbia University. So here you see her at an exhibition with one of her prints that is in the current show uh, titled Fantasy. One of the things evident in Uchima's work are certain aspects of the creative print movement with its, um, it has this emphasis on expressing the interiority of the artist. There is an undeniable boldness to many of her prints. And I think maybe also a kind of vivid psychological force. This comes through not only in her titles, but also her palette and the kind of forceful marks she must have made in the block with her carving tools. Um, but also in scale. These are among the largest works in the exhibition. Solitude on the left, which was shown in the group's first exhibition in 1956, this print is more than three feet high. It's an enormous print. And in person, these works are really impressive. And then Wind on the right, uh, I think it must have caught the eye of the Japan Times art critic um, when she visited the group's fourth annual show in 1959 because it was published uh, in the review. But then there are prints like Bridge from 1965, which is so different in its mood and its subtlety. This print probably takes inspiration from the George Washington Bridge, which could be seen from the windows of the family's apartment in Manhattan. <clears throat> I really find Uchima Toshiko one of the hardest artists to categorize from the Joryu Hongo Kyokai. And I think that has to do with the fact that her printmaking lasted only a very short time. When the Uchimas moved to the United States, Toshiko continued to send prints to the annual shows and she stayed a really active participant in the group. But she made very few prints after the family's immigration. Her son, Anju Uchima, who has lent very generously to this show, has recalled that although his father's studio was right there in the home, he couldn't remember his mother ever entering the studio. So perhaps to forge a path that was separate from her husband's work, uh, Toshiko left printmaking behind in 1966, uh, turning instead to a practice of collage and assemblage. Had she continued making prints, I really do wonder how her work might have developed. Minami Keiko was the oldest of the founding members of Joryu Hanga Kyokai and a little bit unusual in her biography. She lived abroad in France for much of her career. Um, she had moved to Tokyo from distant Toyama prefecture at age 35 in 1946, after the end of the war. Minami had been interested in poetry and painting since she had been a child. And upon moving to Tokyo, she had originally hoped to become an illustrator of children's literature. I think you can still see elements of that early interest in her etchings like those you see here. Um, her touches on the plate are very fine. Her colors tend to be understated and there's that little bit of deliberate sort of naivete in her draftsmanship that you often see in children's books. The settings are sometimes fairy tale like with castles and towers. And I think what she's especially good at is creating a scene that implies narrative. The viewer is almost looking for a story to complete the picture. I also think they're sort of, somehow they manage to be sweet without being cloying or saccharine, which is kind of remarkable. Minami began etching after meeting the artist Hamaguchi Yozo, whom she would later marry. In 1954, she moved with Hamaguchi to Paris where they would remain for nearly three decades. Her prints have been popular almost since the moment she began creating them. In 1956, the city of Paris acquired one of her works, and within two years, both the Museum of Modern Art in New York and UNICEF were reproducing her prints for greeting cards. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> Minami's prints are often described as delicate or whimsical, but I've wondered about the kind of gendering nature of those terms and if we would use them if she had been a male artist. The more I look at her work, the more the sparseness and the absences of her prints stand out to me. There is also, I think, an eerie quality to the empty spaces of her prints and to her drawing style, almost a kind of alienation or aloneness. Uh, and in talking with other curators, comparisons to artists like Edward Gorey or even Paul Clay have come up. So an alternate reading of her work might recognize that there is also something eerie and maybe even unsettling in her prints. Another underappreciated aspect of her work, I think, is her design sense. Um, a few of her prints, such as these, hint at other directions she might have taken. Now, this is just speculation, of course, but like Uchiman Yoshida, Minami was married to a fellow artist, one whose career eclipsed her own and whom she would have supported, I am certain, in a thousand ways at home. I am also certain that their life in France offered some greater freedoms than Japan of the 1950s and 60s. Nevertheless, prints like these suggest some different directions in design and abstraction that remain unexplored. Kobayashi Donge's story is also that of an artist shaped by her time. In 1945, she wanted to study at the Tokyo School of Fine Arts, what we call today Geidai. Uh, but at that time, only men were accepted to the prestigious art university. <clears throat> so instead, she enrolled at Joshibi Women's University of Art and Design, where she studied in the Western Painting Department. Now, this is... Um, this is a pretty common feature of the biographies of a lot of women artists um, from this period and this generation in Japan. Um, there were just a handful of art schools where a number of women were allowed to study and take classes. Kobayashi is pictured here in the photograph on the left with a printing press in the background. And she only began engraving in 1951 when she joined a study group at the home of artist Sekino Junichiro. One of the things that I think is kind of lost when thinking about printmaking in the early 1950s is the actual difficulty of acquiring the necessary equipment. <clears throat> Not only would she have needed access to a press, but in the beginning, Kobayashi apparently had trouble getting her own tools. So buying a burin, which is the basic tool of the engraver, and whether that was for reasons of scarcity or gender or both, I don't know. Um, but she clearly had an affinity for the medium. She produced surreal, dreamlike intaglio prints with a lot of tonal range. She coaxes out these velvety, beautiful backgrounds um, and really understands how to utilize the white of the paper for that contrast. Early in her career, Kobayashi developed a distinct vocabulary. Femme fatales and inscrutable female figures were quite common. She drew equally from her own imagination and from famous works of literature and mythology. So this print on the right takes up the subject from Greek myth of uh, Zeus um, disguised as a swan in order to seduce Leda. Uh, other subjects were inspired by the range from the poet Sappho. Uh, there's an entire series dedicated to the story of Salome, complete with all of the gruesome uh, details. Uh, but Ko Kobayashi also took up Japanese literature. The print on the left comes from a portfolio illustrating uh, the celebrated Japanese work, Ugetsu Monogatari, or Tales of Moonlight and Rain. Um, the title of this print refers to a very famous story within uh, the Tales of Moonlight and Rain about a husband who returns home to a house that has been choked by reeds due to neglect and he had, um, in his absence, his faithful wife had become a ghost um, in Japanese 
older Japanese culture, it's a, one of the scariest things. Um, so Kobayashi was an artist with a distinct point of view and her depictions of these seductive femme fatales and symbolist influenced fancy, fantasies, um, it, it does seem that they uh, perturbed exhibition reviewers and writers in the period, in the, in the 50s and 60s. And from what I have learned about Kobayashi and her biography, I do get the sense that she was known for something of a strong personality, which certainly in the 50s would have been remarked on in a Japanese woman. I know that she had a young son when she went to France in 1964, where she stayed for about a year and a half. Um, she went alone to France. Uh, while she was in Paris, she spent time with Minami Keiko, and Hamaguchi Yozo, who probably introduced her to a lot of people. Um, and she also talked about going to see art constantly while she was in France. And she has this great quote that I love to love to tell every time, um, where she says that she liked William, William Blake and Alfred Beardsley. And I think you can certainly see both of those in her work, but she hated Cezanne, which I just think is such a, a so true. Um, of her work. Uh, she also, I think, had a real penchant for symbolist artists. So the marsh flower or Numa no Hana is a title that she gave to quite a few different prints. Um, for this version, when I saw this print um, of, a, of a, the, a flower sort of emerging from the swamp, I thought she must have seen this portfolio by Odilon Redon. This is his uh, version of what he's titled the marsh flower a sad human head. Shima Tamami joined the Joryu Hanga Kyokai in 1959 and contributed works to their fourth exhibition. As I mentioned earlier, she was one of only two uh, women artists selected for Michener's deluxe limited edition book celebrating the modern Japanese print. Her signature subject is birds, so this is a fitting example of her work to include. She was another artist like Iwami who tended to search out wood blocks where the grain of the wood was especially pronounced and could be beautifully enhanced with tonal printing. This is a quality that I think would have especially appealed to Michener uh, and to the American collectors he helped to cultivate because it made it made visible, especially for someone like Michener, this tangible connection to the materials of traditional Japanese woodblock printing. On the right, you see the invitation card to the fourth exhibition. It was designed by Yoshida Hodaka, Chizuko's husband. By this time, the group had moved to holding their exhibitions at the seventh floor gallery of the Toyoko department store in Shibuya. The quote at lower right, um, it comes from a, a famous poet and art critic uh, named Takiguchi Shuzo, who by this time was also well-established as an artist. He was also something of a mentor to a number of um, uh, artists who are known today for being rather avant-garde. Um, so having a figure of Takiguchi's stature sort of as part of the almost advertisement for their upcoming show, I think indicates something of this group's seriousness of purpose. This was not just mama-san printmakers indulging their hobby. The group's membership was fluid, but it, it did steadily expand over the decade. Uh, Enokido Maki was a slightly younger artist who joined the Joryu Hanga Kyokai in 1963. Enokido had graduated from a school called Bunka Gakuin a few years prior, and already she had won prizes in exhibitions with the Japan Print Association, that, that very large, uh, prestigious print association. At left and right are works from her early series titled Efflorescence. In Japanese, this title, Kaika, can also be translated as um, blooming or blossoming. And indeed, these are usually understood as sunflowers blossoming, as you can sort of begin to see from uh, uh, the yellow center of this spiral, which 
does indeed look like sunflower seeds. <clears throat> but I would also argue that there is a larger interest in her early work in biomorphic forms, as you can see in this vertical uh, efflorescence print on the left and the untitled monochrome print at the center. Um, the swirling psychedelic colors of these prints can be a little bit of a distraction from the fine lines that she has drawn with an etching needle. Uh, these prints put me a little bit in mind of artifacts from the fossil record, sort of like the spiral shell of an ammonite found. Um, so these have been a really wonderful surprise in the course of working on this exhibition. And of course, there were many more artists. Uh, here you see more works from the Portland Art Museum collection. Takahashi Junko on the left, who worked with, in etching, and Motoyama Michiko and Tochigi Junko, who both worked with woodblock using bright planes of color. So if you didn't believe me in the beginning that this was a really diverse body of work, um, I think that this begins to sort of make that case. Um, <clears throat> and I just didn't have room to fit these into the show. As I mentioned at the beginning, this was a group that came together as professionals, a society that provided a really essential means for talented female printmakers to present their work. You can see uh, here on the left an installation photograph from the seventh exhibition in 1962. And then at right, I'm not yet sure which year this was, but this is also from one of their exhibitions with the artists seated around the table. They look relaxed, they're smiling. I do think that there was a genuine sense of camaraderie that suffused their efforts and probably helped sustain their mutual support of one another. I know that a number of the artists maintained friendships for decades after the group stopped exhibiting together. Uh, Uchima Toshiko in New York City kept up a very regular correspondence with Iwami Reka um, and Moriyasu who are in, in this picture. They're on the opposite ends of the table. Moriyasu is in the polka dot dress. Um, and Yoshira Chizuko who's seated with her back to the camera um, also stayed in touch with others as well. In closing, I have to say that this exhibition's really warm reception by visitors to our galleries and the uh, interest people from around the world have expressed, all of this has reinforced to me just how needed stories of this kind are. Um, this exhibition at the Portland Art Museum is the first of its kind, but I hope it is not the last. I hope that future scholars and collectors and lovers of Japanese art and 20th century printmaking will um, pursue more research on this remarkable group of artists. Um, I'm working on an essay on the Joryu Hanga Kyokai as a collective. And in the meanwhile, we're developing a virtual version of the exhibition, which will live online and have high resolution images. So you can see the prints in detail. Um, for now, I hope today's program has piqued your interest in the artists of the Joryu Hanga Kyokai and that bringing this piece of lost history has helped expand how you understand the story of the modern Japanese print. Thank you. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, thank you so much, that was awesome. Um, and before we jump into q and I just wanted to um, make a note to everybody that if you're watching this through the webinar, if any questions come up for Jeannie, please put them in the Q&A box. Um, and then if you're watching on Facebook live stream, um, just enter your questions into the chat and then we have somebody that will help to migrate them over here to Zoom for us. Um, and while people are sort of collecting their thoughts, I already have, if it's okay, I already have like a question that I'm really interested in. Mm. Um, well, first off, I, this show is really beautiful and I love, I've, I've seen it twice <laughs> and I really love the shot. Um, and one of the things that I was thinking about, um, and I hope this question isn't confusing because my brain sort of jumbled at the moment, but I'm so interested in the language of abstraction and how 
I think less now, but at one point it was heavily tied to a very particular kind of subjectivity, mm -hmm. that being like white, male. Um, and so I'm really interested, uh, Jeannie, to hear more about how you're thinking or how you're viewing the language of abstraction showing up in the work um, and specifically like how it's being used or employed by artists whose bodies are marked as like both, you know, women and Japanese women. Um, and sort of what abstraction offers in that moment of like being able to think through um, different ways of expressing. I don't know if that made sense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I feel like there's several questions in there or threads to pick up. That's an amazing question. Thank you. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is the 19, this is mid 1950s, right? When they begin uh, all, all of the main artists that I focused on were founders and they were all shown in that 1956 show. They've been making prints for at least a couple of years. So we're pretty coterminous here with um, <clears throat> kind of the spread of, uh, by one version of art history of abstract expressionism across the globe. Um, you know, one of the things that kind of complicates my understanding or sort of ability to talk about some of the abstraction that I see in their work or in printmaking in general is that, you know, there's, um, there's a counter narrative that's, that's been argued actually in a, in a new book that just came out, but it's not a recent argument that there are non-Western forms of abstraction that are earlier than a lot of sort of immediate post-war uh, American abstraction or art informal in Europe. Um, so, so I don't, I don't know. I never know quite how important the chronology argument is, but indeed there are examples, and lots of people have talked about them. Of, um, you know, this kind of abstraction was already occurring in Gutai, or it was already, you know, this is a which is an avant-garde group in, um, in, uh, in Japan, um, in the mid-century um, or, you know, so forth. There's, there's all of these examples. Um, you can see it in calligraphy, you can see it in painting, but I think because printmaking, printmaking produces this wrinkle actually, um, because it, it's that much more removed from the hand of the artist, which I think a lot of the narrative around abstraction as we understand it as key to um, modernism is really keyed to this uh, concept of, you know, the haptic, the artist's touch and their hand um, really involved in, um, in that production, that the, both the creative process and the physical production of a work. Whereas printmaking then introduces all of these intermediaries, right? Uh, uh, there's, the idea of multiples, there's the idea that, um, you know, it's multiple pulls on the block. So I think, you know, someone who's a, a scholar of Western printmaking might have a, a better answer for that. But, but I think here we're working with so many more layers. So it's not only non-Western, it's also, and they're all aware of this, it's non-Western, it's printmaking. And I should say a lot of the abstraction that you see, especially in those who are working in um, relief techniques, so woodblock, which is very close to woodcut, but a little bit different. Um, male artists who are also working in woodblock at this moment, their work looks rather similar. So it's, you know, it's shared between, you know, it's not a gendered issue necessarily, but I have to think that for women who are, um, for this group in particular, but for many women artists of this period who are, are doing prints in Japan, um, you know, you asked about how are they using or deploying that. I think I think they're very conscious of the fact that that is not only one of the ways to be modern and sort of creative and expressive in this moment, but it's a way to kind of be taken seriously. And so I think it's not a coincidence that there is so much abstraction in their work, even if like Iwami Reka, who I showed at the beginning, and then the second artist, Yoshida Chizuko, who you see here on the far left, that with both of them, the, the titles, at, at minimum, the titles indicate there's always a reference. It's not just purely non-objective abstraction. There's always a reference. And they both kind of later gravitate back toward things that look 
even even less um they're, they're still abstracted but they're um the sense of a landscape becomes stronger you know and sort of more visually apparent um so i hope that goes some way toward answering your question yeah definitely thank you and it just was making me think about when you're talking about uchima toshiko's work and you were talking about the interiority of the artist yeah um I don't know. I have no other point other than I just felt like that's a very beautiful way of looking through the work and seeing these different perspectives, um, such as traveling or like, you know, observing the sound of, of rain or and, and allowing that like interiority experience of simply of being alive in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. like filter out through the um, abstract language in the work. So mm -hmm. it's very beautiful. I'll just do one last thing on that, because I think, you know, I was working on this show sort of starting in late 2019, but then into 2020. And there, I do, I, it's hard not for me not to understand what they were doing in sort of, I don't think they were necessarily bucking the establishment, but I think that there was this element of kind of organizing in the same way that we talk about political organizing and grassroots organizing. I think there was definitely an element of that in what they were doing. It was, it wasn't necessarily an act of rebellion, but it was, I think, an act of resistance. And I, I don't, I think it's a, that's an anachronism in many ways to say it in that, that those terms, because I don't think they would have put it that way. But I think, I, I think nevertheless, that is an aspect of what was going on in, in the sort of just the, the apparatus that they were building. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then we've got some um, audience questions. So the first question is, why did the group disband? This is a great question. It's come up before. I wish I knew sort of the, what's the, what's the term? Smoking bullet answer, smoking gun answer for it. Um, there's a few different theories that are floated and I have some anecdotal evidence, which is that <clears throat> they're exhibiting together for 10 years slowly over the course of um, those 10 years, more and more of the members are joining the kind of mainstream uh, art associations and societies that I talked about, the Japan Print Association being one of them. Um, in the beginning, there's only like three of them that are members of that out of a membership of, I don't know, 50 some or 100, something like that. Um, so that's one. Two, uh, you know, they be, they're becoming increasingly better known. Three, many of them are married, have children, have families. There are a lot of expectations around that um, that are, of course, different household to household, but um, a factor, particularly in 1950s and 60s Japan. And I think that one of the reasons that they disbanded was simply that they kind of um, achieved an end achieve you know sort of achieved the original ends of the group which was to um not that they ever had a manifesto where they stated their goals but i think they they reached a level of success in kind of the the main outlets that um male and female artists were 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 sort of reaching for and so they sort of they they sort of didn't need the group anymore in some respects and you know because they weren't like a movement that had a sort of a shared way of making work or a shared kind of look to their work or you know there wasn't an ideology that united them um it was really more of this organizing principle um i think that they it just they didn't need it the other piece of it is i think it was a lot of work i think you know they were they um, they seem to have rotated, sort of took turns in having one person be the main sort of um, contact. They call it the Jimu Show, sort of the administrative person for each of the exhibitions. And they weren't just doing annual exhibitions, they were doing them more than annually. And some of them were abroad and so forth. So I think it was a lot of work. And I think they just decided it it was, it was just too much. After I gave um, one version of this talk, I got, um, uh, received an interesting piece of evidence, which is, which uh, someone else has cast a little bit of doubt on, but it's a letter from one member to another that, that sort of complains about how much work it, it's all become and sort of saying, maybe we should just stop doing this. 
you know, that, you know, like this is just, this is just kind of a lot of work. I understand now that that, that artist ten, tended to write in that way. So, and Japanese language is very full of um, not being direct. So, um, so I, you know, that's anecdotal sort of circumstantial evidence, but I think, um, so I, I think those two reasons, one that it was, it was a lot of labor to put on and that also they had, they had kind of obviated their own, the need for themselves as a group. Thank you. Um, and then another question from the audience, how common is it in Japan for galleries to be located in department stores? Oh, what a good question. Um, pretty common and you'll even find them today. Now they're not, um, there was a time, and I would say this is more sort of first half of the 20th century, also somewhat in the 19th century, certainly first half of the 20th century, and then maybe into the like 60s, 70s, where it was kind of the primary vehicle for um, contemporary art shows. Uh, now you can still go to some of the sort of fancier department stores in Japan, particularly in the big cities, like in Tokyo, in Osaka, and there'll be sort of a gallery floor or a section of a floor that's sort of devoted to that. And there'll be these sort of short run exhibitions. It's very common for ceramics, for instance, um, but other art forms as well. Um, so, it, so it was pretty common, but there was, there was a time when it was kind of like, the main way to have shows outside of um, outside of a museum, for instance, which there were not a lot of contemporary art exhibitions at museums at uh, like the older museums at this time. Yeah. And there's another audience question: Are there similar female groups today? Oh, what a great question. You know, not to my knowledge, not um, not united as a group of women artists. Um, I could be wrong about that uh, in Japan, but no, certainly not a women's printmaking society. And I should say, you know, there are a number of uh, women printmakers of this, even of the same generation in Japan who didn't join this society. So I've always thought that was sort of an interesting question. You know, I think to some extent it, membership might've been guided by um, relationships and friendships and that kind of proximity. Um, but there are other artists who, um, you know, Minami Keiko and others were, were working, Uchima Toshiko were working abroad, but there are others working abroad who are even better well-known today like Matsubara Naoko, who is in Canada, um, Oda Mayumi, who's in Hawaii. Um, these, are, these, these are also really fantastic artists who were printmakers primarily, who have had long and productive careers, who weren't part of um, Joryu Hanga Kyokai. But I, I do think that they, they knew about the group. They have a lot of the same contacts and, and connections. They just may not have you know, needed that kind of support or you know, wanted to be a member, but unfortunately, I, I don't know about groups today. Thank you. And our final question, as you mentioned, it says you mentioned wood block versus woodcut. Can you talk more about that? An excellent talk. Oh, thank you. Um, also a very good question. Um, there are some like nuances to describing the differences, but essentially, um, with woodcut, you are using some of the differences is that they're both relief processes. So everything that's, you know, remaining as probably the person who asked the question knows um, when you carve, carve the surface, anything remaining up, so to speak, um, will be printed, right? So it's, you think of it as a reverse process. So whatever you carve away is blank space. Um, and in woodcut, uh, basically you're using a thicker paper much, much thicker. Um, your inks are tend to be more uh, viscous and thick, kind of sticky. Um, not so much as not as much as intaglio printmaking, but they're still quite a bit heavier and thicker. And then you're using a press, most likely, and producing a lot of force in uh, printing the the image, whether that's a monochrome image or color. Um, with woodblock printing, it's more it's 
I really hesitate to draw a continuous line from traditional Japanese woodblock printing, but they are using a lot of the traditional methods in some respects. Um, so the paper is still very, very strong, but it's much thinner. Um, you don't need nearly as much force. You're not using a press. Uh, they often using in the in the modern period, they're often using um, blocks of um, plywood and basewood, you know, that you don't need cherry blocks because you're not probably not doing a run of a thousand or more prints. You're probably doing a pretty small addition. Um, and so when you put the paper onto your matrix and you can actually press and rub either with a barren, which is a tool that was used in traditional uh, woodblock printmaking in Japan, um, or you could use something else. Um, so it's really just the, the pressure of your, your body uh, pushing down. So those are two of the main differences. Also the, the inks and colors are, um, can be a lot thinner because you don't need that level of intense pressure. Well, it looks like that's it for questions. Cool, thank you, Jeannie. Uh, thank you so much for your time today and for putting this very beautiful exhibition together. Um, looking forward to how the online um, version of it is gonna unfold. Um, and I wanna thank everybody for attending today's program, our last darn conversation of the year. Um, please keep an eye out on our, on the museum's um, blog page as well as the events calendar. Um, just, you know, keep an eye and check it because we're going to be updating um, the upcoming series of Art and Conversation Talks for 2021. Thank you everyone for coming and thank you Jalisa for organizing this amazing series. I'm excited to see what you bring on in 2021. Thank you. Thanks Judy. All right, everybody, have a good morning.